it's a treasure hunt out there. So to go work antique stores and trading posts and looking for that great bracelet or that great piece of beadwork, when you find that, it, there's it's it's such a charge. I can't explain. It's like riding a bull. If you've ever and I've rode a few bulls, mm -hmm. and when you ride a bull, that eight seconds, it's one of the biggest highs you can ever have. Michael Bradford walked into my gallery today. He does that periodically, about once or twice a year, I'd say. Is that right, you think? Yeah, probably once or twice a year, and then uh, Buck, my son, gets down here to see you yeah. every once in a while, usually after the high noon show in Mesa. He's easier to work with, actually, I think. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> he gives my stuff away. I know, I like that. <laughs> Send Buck next time. I know the prices, he doesn't, and so... <laughs> Yeah, he comes back with money. I'm really proud of him. He does a great job on the road. So, yep. yeah. so who I let me just we'll back it up. I got Michael Bradford now. Michael, I've known for close to 30 years, I think, and um, you've gone through a lot of different changes in your life, and I want to go through those, but I don't know exactly where the roots begin, though. It sure sounds like an Oklahoma accent, but. Let's start. Let's start from the beginning. Where were you born, Michael? Yeah, well, that accent is a Texas accent. I was born in Dallas, Texas. Oh and, yeah, well, that's an insult to you, then, isn't it? No, nah, I like Dallas. I mean, I wouldn't want to live there anymore. But Dallas yeah. is a, a great town, and but I was raised in Arlington, and uh -huh. all my aunts and uncles had ranches out in uh, West Texas, Ranger, Thurber, Cisco, and. They were ranchers, farmers, yeah. and one of my uncles was a sheriff. So that's my roots, Texas. And so how big was Arlington when you grew up as a kid? Boy, it wasn't very big at all. Twenty five, thirty thousand, uh -huh. maybe. And this is when? When did you? Uh, I left home when I was seventeen in nineteen sixty eight. Ah. So, right. so you so and what did your mom and dad do? Well, my dad was an insulator on big power plants, uh -huh. and he traveled around the country, and that's the way he supported us. And my aunts and uncles were a lot in, in, involved in the asbestos pipe covers union in Dallas. My granddaddy worked on oil wells and in the uh -huh. power plant companies, things like that. And did any of that asbestos end up getting to him at all, or no? Uh, my dad died. Of um, asbestos? Yeah. I'm sure, you know, it was before anybody was aware of it, but he died when I was 18 after I joined the Navy. Uh-huh. So. And so did you join the Navy to get away from the family, or...? Just get away from Arlington or what? A young kid wanting to see the world and, you know, a little unhappy at home and wanted to go do something. So I And that I, was sixty eight? Nineteen six I joined in sixty seven and uh So that's the height of the Vietnam War. Yeah, well, it, the Vietnam War actually kind of got started, uh, escalated after I was in the Navy. Okay. I had a so you got buddy it. of mine that was on in the Gulf of Tonkin, yeah. on, and that I can't remember the name of the uh, cruiser, the destroyer, uh, but he was in the gun mount that got shot, but nobody was wounded. But uh -huh. that's when it started. Yeah, I mean, boy, because yeah. like '68, they had. You know, Tet Offensive, it was really yep. a reference. Yep. So, well, I was in the Navy. I wasn't in the, the yeah. front of the battle. Thank no, goodness, well, yeah, but, but, yeah, but you, yeah. What yeah. did you do in the Navy? What was your job? I was an electrician's mate, and uh -huh. I actually, I was on the uh, USS Bryce Canyon, uh -huh. and it was a destroyer repair ship, and I we would go on board and rewire ships that had been damaged or need, needed uh -huh. new wiring, and and I can't remember the name of that ship. I, I have it on the tip of my tongue, but it came into Hawaii. We would go back from Hawaii to Long Beach, is where we were stationed. And Hawaii at. being big, being Honolulu. Uh, uh, Oahu, yeah, yeah, Oahu. Uh, yeah. yeah, we were at Ford Island yeah. there, and so and actually that ship, uh, um, God, I can't remember the name of it. Came in alongside us, and we repaired that ship. Mm -hmm. And so when you joined, did you do it because you just wanted to be in the Navy, or was it, I'm, I don't want to go to Vietnam? This no, is better... I, I actually was going to join the Marine Corps, and I had a cousin that was in the Marine Corps, and he did not, he wanted to, he says, if you join the Marine Corps, I'm going to kick your ass. I, I said, but I really want to do it. Don't do it. Uh -huh. And, you know, for whatever reason, young, you know, right. I joined the Navy. And you know, I like, I, I thought the idea of being on water and traveling right. and going yeah. places. Especially from Texas, right? Oh, yeah. That yeah. Seemed so, very, yeah. You know, I, I don't know if you knew that, but I was a naval doctor. Do you know that? 
I didn't know that. Yeah, I was really. active duty for four years and another really? yeah. Yeah, another five reserve, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I enjoyed the Navy. I got to see part of the world. I never <clears throat> got as far as Hawaii. I was stationed on the East Coast in Boston. Yeah. I was on the USS Henry W. Tucker for a while, and they were putting ASROC missiles on our destroyer in Boston. Mm-hmm. I spent about a year and a half in Boston, which was a great, I love Boston. I love the atmosphere. And then we came around, uh, loaded up with uh, uh, missiles yeah. at uh, the West Virginia Missile Munition, yeah. Norfolk, I think it was. Went past through the uh, Panama Canal. Now that's got to be stopped fun. In, it was fun. Stopped in Acapulco for four days and back up to Long Beach. And how many years did you do in the Navy? I did about four and, four and a half years. Yeah, so you they, went through the whole NOM experience. They extended huh? me. Uh, I didn't get out when I was supposed to because of the war. Uh-huh. So. And did you ever have to, you didn't ever have to go to the South Seas as far as, the, or the Pacific Asian area? At all? No, we never, I never did make it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I actually was going on the Henry W. Tucker and I had, uh, my granddaddy died or my dad died and I had to go home. Uh-huh. So they took me off the ship, and I was supposed to meet them in Japan, but some way they transferred me to the Bryce Canyon. I never made it. Hmm. So it was back and forth from Hawaii to Long Beach every six months for the last two years uh, that I was in the service. And do you think your dad <coughs> dying so young? I mean, that's 18. He was You were really young. Did that affect you, do you I, think? Probably, I don't know, to a certain extent. Uh-huh. But, you know, I was really sad about it, but... My that was my stepfather, my real dad, my stepfather, my granddaddy all died within like six months. Wow! So and that was just all. This is those young men. Yeah, yeah. Well, my granddaddy was older. Yeah, you know. So, uh-huh. but you know, you just pick up your the load and keep on going. Yeah, so, yeah. But I was, yeah. It hurts like any time you use your. But you had to. I mean, you were a guy that had to support himself. There was nobody. Sitting in the back, going, "No, nope. come back home, kid, or we'll help you." you no, nope. yeah, you were nope. on your own. No, nope. I made it up from my, you know, I just worked my way, my way up, and went back and went to college for almost a year. Went to Tarleton State College, and I was on the rodeo uh, team there, or not on the team, but I was on, you know, I participated in the rodeos at Tarleton State, right? And I did jackpot bull riding at the Mesquite uh, Rodeo and all around Texas. And this was after? After I got out of the Navy. So you get out, you're Went 22, to college for a while. And then you, you go know. to, where do you, where was the college? Tarleton State in Stephenville, Texas. Uh-huh. And you were on the rodeo team at that time? No, I wasn't on the team, but I practiced with, with the team and stuff. But I and, then, and ultimately, you went and tried to make a living as a rodeo guy, right? Well, I, I tried to. I wasn't as good as Larry Mahan wrestled those guys, but I had a lot of fun. And, and you knew him, right? I did know them, you know, yeah. And Jim Shoulders and that whole crew back then. And you did that for a lot of years, right? Well, off and on for about 12 years straight it's a long time as a rodeo guy and you yeah, did but bulls I, I rode bulls and bareback horses uh-huh. and which is easier or should uh, i say which is well, harder it depends <laughs> on neither one asking is. neither one of them are very easy yeah. i think the, the bulls are a little more difficult but the, especially today these young boys that are riding in the pbr rodeo uh-huh. i watch these bulls these bulls are double tough i i don't know how those kids stay on those bulls we had tough bulls. I, you know, I've been on Snuffy a couple of times, Double Alt and other of those bulls. But today's bulls, I don't know how those boys ride them. And when you, I, this is before you would have helmets. You'd have a hat like you have on yeah, no, right now. There was you, no helmets. Right, it's just get on the bull. and. Yeah. What's that like to get on a something that's really mad and wants to it makes hurt your, you? It makes your heart throb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of adrenaline going on, but you know it didn't bother me for years about it. You know, you just suck it up and get on it, and you're aware of that. You know, they're dangerous, and right. You know, you stay on and do your best, and uh, it, it, people get hurt in all accidents, so it's just part of the game. And I didn't really think about it, but you know, there's a lot of adrenaline rush when you climb on the back. Yeah, right. Of, I of mean, a bull. yeah, and yep. and what's the most likely? To get hurt, is it actually in the shoot, or is it once you're out in the ring and they're well, trying you, to stomp your I've face? I've seen people get hurt in the shoot. I've too. seen people come out that didn't know when you get off a bull, you need to get off running, rolling, get away from the bill the bull. Yeah, I've been to rodeos, and when I first started about saying this is enough, I watched a young kid that got on a bull that had never ridden a bull up in one of the towns in California, yeah. and he just curled up in the fetal position. The bull just kept 
it was a spinning ball and came around and stomped him around the head and he was just gone that quick. Yeah. Did so that a, affect you when you saw that? And yeah, said, it did affect me. Yeah. Of course it did. And I had a buddy getting on a bull and I was pulling his rope at that. And I, and he says, what, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know. What are you going to do? I says, you're up next. I says, well, you, <laughs> right after he just got yeah, killed. I says, I, you know, it's, I think you got to do it. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it, you got to go. Yeah. He says, yeah, I'm afraid if I don't, I, I, I may not do it again. And so we, I just pulled up his rope. His name was Rich Gondola. Uh -huh. He's a pretty good bull rider. I'll never forget that. And he just looked at me. So we, I tugged his bull rope up for him, and he took a wrap, and away he went and rode the bull, too. He did ride the I bull. I don't know if he won, but he, he rode the bull. And how long was it between the kid who gets killed and dragged off the thing, obviously, and Probably, you know, five you knew or, he was five dead. or ten minutes. Yeah, and you, you know, knew he the was ambulance. dead at that time. Oh, I knew a minute. I saw it. Yeah, he got crushed. Yeah, he was done. Yeah, yeah, it was like, you know, I'll never forget. Never have forgot it. You know, it was and tragic. Did, and did the bull rider that had to go after? Did he continue going on from yeah. that point on? He yeah. kept rodeoing. Yeah, yeah, he kept rodeoing. But you I, were done. No, I kept going for a while, and I drew a bull called Sharky at the Monterey Rodeo, and this Sharky was just a lunch eating son of a gun and he'd <laughs> hurt people big sharp horns and i had uh two kids at that point you know i wasn't making a lot of money i love the sport loved going and doing it. it it was just part of my life growing up in mm -hmm. texas but you know when i drew that bull i said you know this is stupid i'm not doing it and i just walked away and I uh, had a friend, Vidal Garcia. He was. He says, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. I says, I'm done. I love the rodeo. I'm not going to yeah. do it. That was it. Yeah, I used to deal with Marine Corps uh, airline air, uh, pilots, you yeah. know. And um, I remember one pilot coming in. Yeah. And he said, I can't fly anymore. He goes, he had a bad problem, a nystagmus period. And yeah. he thought he was going to die. And he, yeah. and he handed me his wings and he said, I'm done. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just time said, to... you sure? I just want to make sure. Yeah. He goes, no, I know I'm done. Yeah. He goes, I don't want to see that or do that again, yeah. ever again. Well, it was a, gr a great part of my life. I traveled all over the country, all up and down the yeah. coast of California, Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado, and made a lot of friends. I had a lot of friends that were bullfighters and mm -hmm. clowns. Matter of fact, Chuck Henson is a rodeo clown mm -hmm. here in Tucson. He doesn't do it anymore, but if you ever get a chance to talk to Chuck, I talk to him when I come to town occasionally and and uh i knew chuck really well and gene and bobby clark we went to mexico we put on rodeos in mexico mm -hmm. yeah those clowns in my opinion are the toughest of all of them they're pretty ballsy yeah i mean i had yeah, a friend yeah. in high school who was a clown and yeah no it's a real mm -hmm. important job yeah you know they're bullfighters that's what they, they are, are you know so, yeah no and they yeah. do it repetitively <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah huh? no they're i always admired them and uh I've, luckily, I've had several friends that were, and, and I've known a lot of them. So now you do this bull riding, mm -hmm. okay? Now you got two kids, you're in the rodeo. Yeah. And at what point do you start buying and selling material? Was it? Did you start well, with that, Native that, American? Or that was you... a later thing. I got into making saddles okay. after that. And I uh, learned to make saddles from Bill Rogers in Carson City, mm -hmm. Nevada, who was a Visalia saddle maker. And I worked for Dick Fleming from Fleming Saddlery, making fancy head stalls. And, um, uh, you know, and I kind of did that for a while, made saddles, did leather work. How for, long would that have been that you were? I, I started sales. doing uh, saddle work in, back in 1971, 72, and collecting tools. And yeah. What drew you to those, to making saddles? Was it just well, a job that was there, or was it more no, the creative process? No, I was process? rodeoing, and I knew some I had some friends in Clovis, California, had a thing called the Rodeo Shop. So, and they were saddle makers and belt makers. Mm -hmm. and did, So I started working with them and just kind of fell into it and really liked it and and uh, really wanted to do it. And um, uh, I was at the lake one day with my ex-wife uh, wishing we had some money where I could buy leather tools. And the lake was dried up and we were walking around and found a wallet with $12 in it. It was exactly enough money to buy a Tandy starter leather tool kit, uh -huh. and that's uh -huh. where it started. So you started, and you would do the tooling on the leather? Yeah, Is that I what did you... tooling, and, you know, made, I had a, a, a bareback rigging, rigging company that we made bareback riggings for a while and sold bull rock ropes in Vacaville, California. Uh -huh. 
And then, uh, then I, you know, you, it was hard to make a living at that. So what I finally do, if I finally some way got into construction and I uh, started with a contractor in uh, Davis, California, worked for him about six years building condominiums and uh, 4,000 square custom homes. And then. And you had training as electricians, so. No, well, but the, the electricians Navy. on a ship are completely different. Yeah, so it didn't really houses. help you at all. You had to learn a new trade then. No, I learned, I was, a, a, I learned to be a skilled carpenter. I can make cabinets. I can't make, you yeah. know, I can frame, do finished carpenter work. I did the whole thing. And we actually, I, I did a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, the plumbing on some of the houses, you know, I would solder and put all the plumbing in. So I did that, but never the electrical work on it. Yeah. And so how long were you in the construction business? You no, know, well, about 20 years. And I got That's a, a general, general contractor's license when I moved to Arizona up in Cottonwood. And in the way I happened, I met an old time trader there named Pete Hester. You yeah. may have heard the I name. Know, I know. I know that. And person. I was actually a friend of mine who's a solar Adobe designer wanted me to go help rebuild or he had promised uh, uh, Bill Pete a uh, solar greenhouse mm -hmm. and he hadn't finished it. And he said, would you go help me finish this? I said, well, sure. So I made, met Pete and we went in his house and there was all this great Indian stuff. And I'm going, Oh my God, this is really great. You know? And, and so, and so I just got to talking to him. I said, boy, how'd you get in this business? He said, well, you could do the same thing. I, I don't know anything about it. And so Pete invited me to go to Santa Fe with him. So in between jobs, when I'd have sheet rockers in or electricians that were wiring house, I'd have a week off. And so I'd take off. This was late 70s? This was like 1983. Okay. You know, about 1983, 84. So I started hitting the road with Pete, met Bob Ashton, Ron Munn, and go. I would go on the road with them. Then it, it, you know, and I would watch them what they would buy a brace, and I'm like, what are they doing? What is this? I don't get it, you know. And, and so I just stuck with it, and, I, and they would tell me a little bit, and I'd go to all the auctions, and finally uh, Pete would load me up with jewelry and pottery, and I'd hit the road and just selling, and then I learned to buy and this learned to look. All, this is all old stuff too, pretty much, all right? All old stuff, yeah. yeah and more antique material. Yeah, mainly I started selling prehistoric pottery and beadwork and old pond jewelry. Yeah. And then I started working Hopi and, and buying old dolls at Hopi and from yeah, collections. And, and, what, and when you say you would go up to the Hopi and, and to the reservation and buy yeah, stuff from Yeah, I, I spent about 15 years off and on trading up there. I'd take fox hides. I would take McCall feathers. I would load up with radios and TVs mm -hmm. and cottonwood root. And I would buy, sell, and trade up there with the Hopis. And, uh, you know, I'd what get, was that like? It, oh, it was wonderful. You yeah. know, the Hopi people are wonderful. And I had a friend of mine that was a Kiva chief that lived in Chimopavi, uh -huh. Howard and Zale, that had the old gas station. And uh, I'll never forget he, one time, he says, I need some leather. He says, I need to make some Hopi mask. I said, oh, really? I said, well, I got a bunch of old leather. Well, next time you come up, we'll do some trading. And one of the first trade deals I did, I took a, a whole hide of leather up to Howard and he traded me uh, a bunch of Kachina dolls and a little bit of jewelry for that hide of leather. Yeah. And so I would gather cottonwood root. I would go up there and sell and trade the cottonwood root to carvers and girls would sell me their Kachina dolls and women would sell baskets and, you know, just a buy, sell and trade. And how long was that? When we oh, I did that, that for about 15 years. And that was from like, 19, probably Early 84, 85 to the late 90s. Uh -huh. I was going up there and Howard died. And you, and you were living in Cottonwood, Cottonwood Arizona. Arizona. So yeah. it wasn't that far to no. a few hours to no. get over to Hopi. And then a few hours and I would stay. Howard had a trailer that I'd stay in and uh, they would feed me breakfast and we would talk. And I got to watch a lot of ceremonies that nobody else saw. Yeah, what's and, that like? Oh, it was really exciting. You know, it's and the smell of the cedar wood and the coal fires. I, I'll never ever forget that. And a couple of years ago, my ex mother in law died, and on the way home, I just couldn't go home unless I went to Hopi. So I just drove through Hopi and reminisce and smell the cedar and the and the coal fired stove. 
wonderful place, wonderful people. Do you have any friends that are still there? Uh, uh, Howard and Zell died. Their sons are still there, and I know, but I just haven't been there in years. I've yeah. been so far away. But I used to take the kids to the dances, and they loved them. And uh-huh. the Kachinas presented them dolls, uh, which is pretty unusual. But uh, we helped rebuild a kiva up there, and so we we're involved. And Hope Bucky spent a summer with Howard up there on the ranch. That's your it, son, Bucky. Bucky mm-hmm. did, and we'd we'd go up once a year and round up cattle and brand and cut. And he had a little ranch below Shimopavi, so we'd go out there and spend the night out there. And Buck spent a whole summer up there moving cattle and working the gardens and whatever they do. So and Howard was a Hopi. Howard was a Hopi chief from Shimopavi. Yeah. Uh-huh. And uh, he actually, he was a Kiva chief from Shapalavi, but his wife, Zell, was in the village of Shimopavi. So. And so is that where you learned your knowledge of Hopi dolls? Because you have a great knowledge of that. Well, yeah, that and I would go ever, anywhere I travel, where it's a field museum or the herd in uh, uh, Phoenix, I went and studied old dolls and, you know, would buy and sell them. Anything I could read, I would read and pick other people's minds and that's the way I learned about them. And if you're so, if you're a young person who's interested in Native American mm-hmm. material, let's say more even antique Native American material, how would you recommend? What would you recommend to them as far as how I'm going to learn about these things? Because you came from a place where you had no experience. Sounds like you didn't have any mentors or anything until you moved to Cottonwood in about '83. Exactly. And so, you know. How, what's your recommendation? Well, there's a lot of books. You know, the Colton books is good. And there's more Kachina doll books that you can read about what the ceremonies are all about, what they mm-hmm. represent, and read every book you can. Talk to knowledgeable uh, antique dealers like myself or you. You've handled great dolls. I've sold you some through the years that were mm-hmm. incredible. And uh, and just observe and see what, what they look like. Right. You know, so... Because it's amazing. I mean, what I see, you know, I see so many fake older dolls coming through all the time. That I mean, they're supposed to be old, and they're clearly not. Right. So, I mean, it, uh, to me, it's one of those fields that you really have to know what you're doing. Yeah, I've had uh, clients who send me pictures of great Kachina dolls they just bought, and they were absolutely, yeah. they weren't even close to it, you know, <laughs> because they went to a flea market right. and thought they'd just save themselves yeah. a lot of money, and they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you deal with a reputable dealer who stands behind right. the material. Go to museums and really study the old yeah, dolls. I think that's that's right. The Herd Museum is a great The example. Herd, the Museum of Northern Arizona, yeah, the Field yeah. Museum has a great collection yeah. of them. But if you're in Arizona, go to the Herd, go to the Museum of Northern Arizona, yep. and really study what you're looking at. Our Medicine Man Gallery. Our Medicine Man Gallery, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got a few of them there, so that would be good. And, you know, the other thing is there's a lot of contemporary Hopi carvers that do old-style dolls. Yeah, that's right. That I think are incredible. Yeah, they are. I, I don't handle them, but a lot of galleries do. I don't know if you do or not. Yeah, we do occasionally. Yeah, well, yeah. I, you know, I think that's a, a, a place to start. Also, if you can't afford to start, you know, 50s dolls or 450 to 650, and then they start going up to 25, 3,500, as you know, up to thirty five, forty thousand yeah. dollars $40,000 for the best of the best. Yeah. So, But you can be a Kachina doll collector at almost any level, but deal with a reputable dealer. Now, when you were spending all that time on the Hopi Reservation, did you ever meet Wilson Teo Cuepto at all? No, he was gone a long time before. He was gone. Yeah, I, I and don't, how about Jimmy Coots? Uh, he was, um, I think Jimmy Coots was gone too, but I'd have to look that up. But I never deal with him. I dealt with his son years ago mm-hmm. up there and bought some things, that, he, and he's still carving dolls. But Jimmy I, Coots' son. I, yes, and I think I may have met him when I first started, but you know I wasn't that knowledgeable and wasn't that experienced. But I, I think I did meet him, but I'd really have to look at the records and see when he died. But right. there's a possibility I did meet him one time. So what? At what point? As a, if you're doing construction, then you're your own person building houses and doing remodels and stuff. What point did you go? I'm switching. I'm going. I'm just going to start buying and selling Indian art and. Dude, About this is a three lot. years into it, I took I, I I did the deal the deal. I just I said you know I think I can do this and and I just started doing that it. That was kind of late eighties. 
Uh, it was probably like 1984. Oh, you know? that was earlier. Because you yeah, started working with Pester 84, then, earlier than that? 84, yeah. I, I met Pete about 1983, and I got involved in it pretty quick. Yeah. I really liked the business, you know. And the first deal I ever did was in Santa Fe, the La Fonda, when all the dealers used to set up at the La Fonda Hotel. My first deal, I sold a Membrino pot to Stanley Marcus. Mm -hmm. And Pete had introduced me and... You know, I had this piece on on consignment, and he says, you know, that guy's a buyer. You should go talk to him. So I met Stanley Marcus, and he bought the the bowl. And I, I don't know, it's two or three thousand dollars, and I made five hundred dollars that day. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> I said, "This is my world." I love. Tell it. people who Stanley Marcus is. He's a Stanley Marcus important is, person. Is the owner just, of Neiman Marcus stores exactly. in Dallas, and yeah. so we became friends. And I sold him a lot of stuff for years and years and years. You know, uh, early pottery and beadwork. Yeah. He stuff. had a great collection of not only native material but also contemporary art and just he did a variety of things. A what, variety. what was it like to work with? With Stanley Marcus. He was one of the funniest guys. He was friendly. It was just like he'd known, he had known you forever. Yep. You know, it was just straightforward. And, you know, I, I remember this story one time. Uh, people can't tell it, but I'm balding. And so I've always been a little thin. Uh, and so I told Stanley, I says, and, uh, I was I got to know him a lot better, and I rubbed his head. I said, "Stanley, I know the cure for that. It's called Rogaine. I've been using it." And so I turned around and looked. Of course, it was all a little fuzzy, yeah. and he, he and Linda just died laughing because <laughs> it, you know it was really a joke. Right. But uh, he he was a really funny guy. I would fly into Dallas. He would introduce me to his friends, yep. and I, I would meet them at their home. Just one of the best guys ever to deal with and be around really nice yeah, and he had an amazing amazing collection i know most of it, i think he just recently i think some of it got donated somewhere i know he's donated a lot of, of the material and he had a collection that went through sotheby's years ago too, right you know because he's passed on but and that's kind of um could you ever imagine you're going to be dealing with him when you're N never uh, in my life you know he's probably I'm, not the only one like that he's no a i've lot met a lot of, of, <laughs> lot of people that you know, somewhat important, I suppose, but it's always been uh -huh. on a one-to-one uh, -one level. It was yes. always been fun. And Stanley, actually, my aunt used to work for Stanley Marcus as a secretary in Dallas. How funny is that? Yeah, that's pretty good. Full so, circle. Yeah, full circle. So, no, yeah, it's it's a good life. I met a lot of people. I've traveled, and you just can't ever replace any of the the situations, dreams, or things that I've done. It's been a really good ride. Right, so you've been doing it since 83. Right. So that's uh, almost uh, 40 years uh, more, 18, 17. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> and um, so you've seen a lot of changes over that time. A lot right? of changes. I've seen a lot of ups and downs and sideways and back and forth. And I just stuck at it and keep digging in and have always survived. Now, you had a little store. I don't know if it was a little, but you had a gallery in, in Cottonwood for I a while, a, right? I have a small gallery in Cotton, in Spavanaugh, Oklahoma. Yeah, but before that, you had a place in Cottonwood. Right? I, I did have a, a gallery in Cottonwood, yeah. Arizona, for about four years. Yeah, and then because you've done a couple things. You've done that, and then you've just kind of went on the road, too. I mean, that's how I always would see you. You always had the great material. I mean... Basically, I've always been on the road. Even when I had the gallery, I had somebody running the gallery. I'd be home, be there for a while, but always on the road searching for good American Indian And what art. was it that you liked that you would get in that RV? Because you always had the RV and the dog. And, right, and, Kalima. Yeah, Kalima, that's right. And and go hit the road. What was it about that versus sitting in the gallery? It's exciting out there. You never know what what treasure you're going to find next, you know, and who you're going to meet. And it's, it's a treasure hunt out there. So to go work antique stores and trading posts and looking for that great bracelet or that great piece of beadwork, when you find that it, there's, it's, it's such a charge. I can't explain. It's like riding a bull. If you've ever, and I've rode a few bulls mm -hmm. and when you ride a bull that eight seconds, it's one of the biggest highs you can ever have yeah. that you conquered that beast. And when you're out there on the road looking for this and you find that great bracelet and you've been to a two dozen antique stores, uh -huh. talk to a dozen people, never, right. you're seeing just junk and you find that piece. It, it, I can't even explain the feeling. It's just in the, it's not, yeah, you're going to make some money, 
But to me, the high, the rush is finding that yes. great thing. And a lot of that is takes uh, a lot of, um, how do I describe it? I mean, you have to be more than just going into an antique store and looking. It's, there's a skill. not a lot there. No, there but, and there's a, but yeah, there's a skill set of talking to people yeah. and then going from there to another house right. to maybe another house, right? Right. And, you know, I talk to people and I network. Do you know anybody? So, yeah, it, you just can't walk in and look. You've got to uh, converse with them, talk to them and win them over and, and you find things like that. But, but it's it's a job. Yeah. It's not always as romantic as right. what people think it is. And did here. you approach it like that? Did you have, OK, I'm going to do this city, this city, this city, yeah. this city, this city and just do a yeah. complete loop kind of thing? I did loops. And how long would an average loop go? Yeah, it depends on how fast I wanted to move. I could do something in a week, but, you know, usually I'd be on the road a couple of weeks and mm -hmm. a couple of weeks home and back on the road again. And, and during that time frame, you'd be not only buying, but also trying to sell. You'd have people, you'd stop uh, yeah. at dealers and clients along dealers the way. Dealers and clients. I had a lot of interior decorators. I sold a lot of things in Aspen. I had a network of people that would call me and need things and and I knew sources. I could come to you if I didn't have it and I could broker it. So right. Uh, you know, I moved, I brokered a lot of material, just like everybody does. Yeah, well, that's because you're trustworthy. People yeah. will give you material. Yeah, right. And that's uh, always a big deal because not everybody's that way. Yeah, I, I, at business. times I had probably close to a million dollars worth of weavings, jewelry, whatever, yeah. and, and, you know, going to do deals. So, And so when you would do these rotations um, and you would find material, when you got done and you pull into Cottonwood, Yeah. How long was it till you go, God, I want to get back on the road? I, you know, it, it was never like that because no. I had plenty to do. You know, I had building projects and a lot of, for a few years, I was building our Adobe home and putting additions on it. And I still did various remodels from time to time for people. So mm -hmm. I was always busy and, you know, it was, I'd come back with enough money to work on the gallery and, and I bought different commercial buildings down in Old Town, Cottonwood. Mm -hmm. So I was doing those kind of things. And then when I'd get low on money and I'd go back out on the road and start working, come back and remodel that, that building and, you know, buy another one. So I, it was, I didn't think I've got to get back on the road because I like being with my family and I like cottonwood and i would right. mountain bike and do things and there were things to do in phoenix and prescott and stuff so uh you know it just when it was time it was time i would go but it was never like i gotta go i gotta go I yeah gotta go. well sometimes the desert calls you yeah no it's uh no the desert does call you like that but the other thing i would run ads i run ads all over colorado in New Mexico like, and, and these Arizona. ads would be in like little newspapers and things like yeah, that, no. thrifty things. And, and if you got a lead, you'd go, okay, I'm going to follow up on that. Yeah, yeah, Those things have changed a little bit, haven't they? Yeah, it doesn't work like it used to. Doesn't, it doesn't it's just not as much material out yeah, there. Yeah, and it doesn't exist like that anymore, does it? Do you run ads anymore? Uh, I, I run a couple of small ones, and they really haven't paid off. But I, I've bought And a is that locally where you live lo now? Locally around and. You know, I advertise the gallery in a couple of papers, and I found a little bit, but it's, there's just not a lot out there, you know. And, and where you have a major gallery like yourself and some in Santa Fe, people come to those storefronts yeah. more than they do, you know, following up on ads. Yeah, and they stuff. don't follow up on those. No, ads. not as much. And as so used. now you have changed a little bit professions, I would say, at this point, because. Your lifelong dream, as long as I've known you, and I've known you again 30 years, I yeah, think, right. has been barbecue. And barbecue and barbecue. Uh, every time, it's always barbecue. barbecue. And I've had his barbecue, and I will <laughs> tell you, it's some of the best barbecue I've ever had. And I can understand why you yeah. want to do it if you can do that. But let's talk about, you know, barbecue. Okay, let's talk about it. So when did you first get interested in that? Oh, God, as a kid in Texas, I was barbecuing. I mean, it, you're raised in Texas on barbecue and barbecue and backyard grilling and stuff. But I got really seriously interested in my travels. I was going back to Tennessee and there was a barbecue convention. And uh, I, I don't know what started it off. I just decided this looks like a lot of fun. And uh, and I, I went and bought a, uh, a big $2,500 
portable uh, barbecue unit in Texas. I bought that and I started doing local events and Greg Eich and I were traveling to Tennessee picking and there was a big barbecue convention with Paul Kirk, who's the Baron of Barbecue. Mm -hmm. So we intend, attended that and got all the paperwork and seminars, how to cut the meat, how long and this, you know, it was really fun. And it was just no looking back for, at that point. And I just started buying more equipment. I did little barbecue events around. And how long ago was that that you started? Do you flip into oh, the barbecue? Oh, God. I think maybe. 20 years ago? 86. Yeah, longer. You know, we started working on 32 it. 32 years ago. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I would do barbecues and cottonwood. And then I would end up in Santa Fe. And I did uh, events for Morningstar Gallery. Yeah, yeah. I went to Ray a lot of different Dury, ones. And I did tons of them for Mark Winter. Yeah. Who was a good friend of both of ours. Yes. And so I did those for him for about four years to, you know, there's about 125 people come in. All of a sudden there's like five, 600 people showing up. <laughs> we didn't know anybody. <laughs> that's, <laughs> you, called, that's called a Navajo res. Oh you my have God. free we, barbecue. You're going to we have some friends come and see. People heard about it and they just kept coming. Yeah. I did a event in Texas. There's a thing called the Round Top. Uh, antique show in Texas. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that. I've heard of it. Never Ed, been. Ed Gage and John Sauls own Marburger Farms, which is a big venue. And I set up there one year selling Indian art and did okay, but they wanted me to come and barbecue. We said, we need you to barbecue. You'll do better. Come and, you know, b barbecue, barbecue. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. So uh, Greg Eich, uh, was involved. He helped me that first year, and we and I had a J and R smoker that I traded from Robert Parsons. Dad had it in Paris, Texas. Mm -hmm. So that was my first big commercial uh, smoker. I traded him for a transitional blanket for the smoker. Mm -hmm. So we hauled that smoker. Robert was probably thrilled. <laughs> yeah, he was probably thrilled. Yeah. But you can talk to him about it. I picked it up in uh, Paris, Texas. Did the trade transitional blanket for a JNR smoker and away we went so we hauled all that equipment and ice boxes and tents and my airstream mm -hmm. to uh, Marburger Farms and I did my first barbecue there and I did it for four years I had a crew of 11 people wow. twice a year and it was really highly successful and but it just got to be too much for one man to handle it all. So, but you made money at it. I'd made money at it. Uh -huh. every, every, you know, I'd go home a big old, uh, big old wad of money in my pocket, and yeah. I could go down to Rockport, Texas, and Ed Gage and I would go red fishing, and Bill Lennox had owned uh, Bob's Chop Houses in Texas. He would come down and meet us, and one year we flew to uh, Costa Rica and did Tabagon Hot Springs. Yeah, it was the life. And now you are in Oklahoma. I'm in Oklahoma. You now. left Arizona and you went to left New Mexico. Well, you left Arizona, then you left New Mexico, right? Because right, you were in Albuquerque. Well, I lived in Santa Fe and Pecos and Albuquerque for about twenty years. Yeah, you know, between those two towns. And then something drew you to Oklahoma. We had a friend that uh, been wanting us to come up there. Long story short, we went up there and looked around Spavanaugh. I bought two commercial buildings. I bought a house on two acres. And tell people where that would be located. Spavanaugh, Oklahoma is an hour and 10 minutes northeast of Tulsa, up in the green country. And we're just below the Grand Lakes of the Cherokee, which is the largest lake in Oklahoma. That's the kind of the big fancy lake. Big fancy lake, million dollar yep. boats, million dollar houses. Yeah, I fished on that before. Once. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, it's a big but lake. We live right on Spavanaugh Lake and Spavanaugh Creek. And as you know, Bucky's a world class fly fisherman. Right. He goes down there and fly fishes for largemouth bass and just hammers them on a regular basis. So you so the, there was an opportunity to buy a place, and you said, "Okay, I'm going to go there." Yep, that's about the. And at that, when you did that, because I know you're, I know you want to do barbecue. Was at that point you go, "Okay, I'm not. I'm going to transition a little bit out of the Native American stuff, and I'm going to just really focus on the barbecue." Yeah, that's that was the deal. I'd like to get something going for my son and to make a place. And this is a small historic Cherokee village since 1829. And it was a booming town back in the 30s when they built the town. And in the 60s and 70s, it kind of started dying off. 
And my goal is to get it rebuilt. We have more people coming in now that I've done the barbecue that are coming in, buying homes and fixing them up. We're, and you actually have a uh, restaurant? Is we, what it is? We've had a barbecue joint open since about uh, August 1st. And what's the name of that? Bradford's Barbecue, uh, Spavanaugh, Oklahoma. Uh-huh. And if people wanted to buy barbecue and have it FedEx, could they do that? We haven't set that up yet, but we're going to be doing that, and we could we could do it right now. Yeah, and do you have a website for your barbecue yet? Go to Bradford's, Oklahoma. Yeah, and that's where you find them. That's where you'll find us. And what's your specialty? Well, every that depends on who you're talking to. Uh-huh. But my son Buck is the. I taught him how to barbecue, and I don't want anybody to tell him, but he's better than his dad. He's taking it to a new level. This kid is probably because there's an art form to it, right? There really an is. Art right? form. It's just you know you just don't put that meat on the fire. There is an art form, and there's it takes a, time, right? It takes a lot of hours, doesn't 12 it? Twelve to fourteen hours to get it right. right? Brisket and pull pork, and there's a certain feel with your temperature gauge and how the meat feels. It's it can be tricky, you know. Yeah. But uh, Buck is the best. We have people coming from now a hundred miles away by word of mouth that have heard about the barbecue. Wow! So and it's been growing ten to fifteen percent every day since we opened. Do you it have up. a sauce yet? Bradford oh, sauce. We've I've always had one. Uh, yeah, we've had one. We do a, a a chipotle sauce and a sweet sauce, and then as we get a little more fine tuned, we're maybe going to have a sauce of the week that Buck will create and do things. But Buck's a world's class pit master, best west of the Mississippi, guaranteed. And so <laughs> I believe I'm gonna. I want to. I want to try it. Yeah, no, you uh, better get out there. Yeah, well, I will I'll come out. Um, and so in your restaurant. Do you also, you have like a little trading post in there as well? I have a gallery, a small gallery next door that I've never emphasized. It's by appointment only. And once we get a little bit settled, I, I think I have a girl that wants to help run it. And we got a mixture of uh, mineral specimens in there, mm-hmm. old American Indian art, folk art. And it's by appointment right now. At some point, when we're fine-tuned, got the barbecue going like we want, then we'll have that open full-time also. And so do you see your years and on the road kind of stopping at this point? I like them to ease down a little bit and yeah. just do one or two shows a year, maybe do you know one show in Santa Fe and continue maybe to do the high noon show in uh Mesa, Arizona. And how about going on the RV and just kind of driving and looking for art and that kind of stuff? Or is it really focused now more? I, that's a secondary I'm thought. Hoping it's, I'm going to pull that art into Bradford's Barbecue and Spavanaugh yeah. uh, uh, Creek Gallery and not uh-huh. have to go on the road as much. And what do you think for our profession? Do you see a, uh, where it's headed for the next generations of Michael Bradford's that get excited about this stuff? There are a few young people out there that are doing it that I'm excited about doing it. And that is the biggest thing is getting young people interested in it. But this business always has been cyclical. So, you know, it's up and down. And I I just love American Indian art so much. And a lot of the things that we handle, they're just not there anymore. And I, I think a lot of it's underpriced for what it is. I think it'll come back. I think people will want to get back out of the tech world and back into the real world a little bit. It's my hope that that will happen. And do you see some international pull there? I mean, I've started to see some of that from different countries. I know you've worked with I Jerry don't, Schumeyer. I don't see it because I'm not in a gallery. I'm dealing with yeah. gallery owners and private clients, but I'm aware of that happening. I know that Terry's been working on uh, the Japanese market, but the Japanese have been coming here and the Germans on beadwork uh, for a, a lot of years. Correct. And right. I Great. think the swain kind of goes back and forth. But yeah, I think there is an international interest in, uh, and always has been. And what, what's materials. your favorite? Now, when I think of you, I always think of you as kind of kachinas and jewelry. I mean, you know it all. You know beadwork too. But is there an area that you think you're little more knowledgeable than your average dealer or you really love i you know i used to think i knew a lot as the older i get i'm not sure what i know but i really love early jewelry i have a fairly good eye for it i haven't been tricked very often on it and old hopi kachina dolls i have an affinity for i love hopi and i love 
old Hopi Kachina dolls. And so on old jewelry, what would you tell people if they're out there you know, wanting to buy it? What, would, what are the things that you look for when you look for jewelry to, that you know it's real? Well, you know, there's always exceptions to the rules, but basically all the early jewelry, you know, pre-1940s, was geometric, round, square, oval, mm-hmm. and that's what you look. Now, there's a lot of contemporary jewelry made to be look old, but you can tell stylistically the way it's stamped, it's just not old. Right. And there's a few silversmiths out there, if they really want to do it, they can make a, br- a bracelet, as you know, that we would never know the difference. But but it, if they're that good, they're going to get a lot of money for it anyway. As a yeah, they're going to get Perry, a lot of the money. The Perry Shorties of the world, yeah, they get paid pretty well. Yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, it, it can be tricky, uh, but you've got to study a lot of old jewelry, talk to some people that have been in the business, talk to people that really know old jewelry, especially the silversmiths that have made those. And one of the best, if I can mention his name, sure. in country is Jimmy Jeter. Yeah, I know. You know, that's the guy I would go, if I'm a little hesitant, I go to Jimmy. You yeah, because he knows construction. He knows construction and the techniques. And he can tell where, you know, I've missed a couple of things sometimes. I mean, uh, so just by it was put together. Yeah, it was put together. I think that's one thing that people don't realize, too. There's a sensibility to Native American jewelry. There is that um, sometimes you get a piece and you look at it and you go, it just doesn't look right. Something's not right. It's not. I don't see a a Navajo or a Hopi making that style or that thing. Or there's something that's off, even if it may have an older appearance or even have wear. Right. I mean, there's old things, yeah. a lot of things that were made and in the 60s pe- that are people can look pretty good, too. P- reproduce wear. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of us, too, is, again, you know, go to the major museums. Go to the Wheelwright. Look at the amazing collections you were from Lars Phillips and Marty Strieber. Yep. Look at the C.G. The, wi- the Wheelwright, I'll tell you, I go every summer when I go to Santa Fe, I go at least twice, maybe three times. I've seen every piece in there. I knew her. I knew the pieces. Some of them, I think there's one I even sold her. Yeah. But I still go and look at it because you, you can learn. You have to refresh your eye. You have to refresh your eye. I think that's refresh a right. That's exactly all correct. The time. And I think for old jewelry, personally, mm-hmm. that there's nothing that um, is better than actually holding it, looking at it. And if you have a loop or a headset, which you need one, if you're going to really want to be serious about that, right. looking at it and feeling right. it. You can only do so much, I think, on the internet. Uh, when it comes to old jewelry, and there's nothing like having it in your hand. Yep, you got to be real careful on the internet. I'll guarantee you that. Yep, because you just sometimes you can't tell. Nope. Uh, and they don't get a you don't get a good enough feel from the photographs. Um, yeah, if you can yeah. study, like you said, with a loop or your eyeglass at old jewelry, if you're if you're in possession, and you do have some. Just look on the inside how it was made, and then you see. But every every smith's going to vary a little bit too. But you can get a feel of the striations, the wear on it. If you really loop a lot of old jewelry, yeah. you're going to see some things that you won't see on newer jewelry. And you'll always see me with a loop on my head. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I you know yeah. that's how I can get down to the nitty and the gritty. Yeah, and see things that I would have missed. And I I think that is one of those. Yeah. If somebody wants to take something away from this podcast, other than barbecue, bull riding. Kachina dolls is, you know, get yourself a loop. <laughs> yeah, get a loop, get a loop. Yeah, yeah I use one pretty religiously. Yeah, of course, you have yeah, to. Yeah. I remember being a younger dealer, seeing a guy with a loop, and I'd be like, What's he I, doing? I could see it with my eyes. Yeah. yeah, well, he was smarter than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, there's some things you, you, you can miss, but yeah, I usually go on instinct, and I've been doing it long enough, but, you know, you can always be fooled yeah. out there. So. Yeah, if your voice says that something's wrong, yeah, probably something wrong. Something wrong. Yeah. Well, Michael Bradford, I appreciate you taking the time. Well, this has been wonderful. It's already been an hour. You believe that? No, I don't believe it. Yeah, no, it's already gone an hour. Yeah. But uh, I want to get down to or up to Oklahoma, go fishing, try some of the barbecue, maybe buy a little art. I got a Cajun bass boat. You can jump right in and go. Oh, wow. <laughs> we <laughs> Done. Go, we could go knock some crappie <laughs> dead real quick. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you for yeah. doing it. I appreciate yeah. it. And thank you for being part of the Native oh, American no. antique business. Yep. You know, you're one of the people that. Big part of my us. life. Yeah, mine too. Yep. Michael Bradford, our dealer diaries. Thank Thanks, you very Mark. much. All right. We we show them a, uh, an Indian handshake. You know, when an Indian dealer handshake. What's that? An Indian dealer handshake. Oh, you know what it is. Let me, let's take a look. At oh, that. yeah, that, that <laughs> yeah. one.
Juan de oh, Dios, yeah, right yeah. there. All right. Let's look at those bracelets. Yeah. All right. All right. Those aren't for sale when they're on his wrist, I can no, assure you. These are not for sale. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. This All has right. been fun. Great. The Art Dealer Diaries are brought to you by Medicine Man Gallery, located for over 26 years in Tucson, Arizona, specializing in antique Native American art, early Western art, including the famed Maynard Dixon, as well as modern art. You can find everything online at medicinemangallery.com. There's over 6,000 objects to select from. Also, the Charles Bloom Murder Mystery Series, written by yours truly, me, Mark Sublett. There's six books in this series, and they follow the protagonist Charles Bloom through all the intrigue of the art world set in Santa Fe and the Navajo Nation. These can be found on Audible, eBooks, Amazon, and of course, the gallery at medicinemangallery.com.